teaching in this series on the, the will of man and we've had a look at uh, various aspects with regards to the will of man already in the past couple of teachings and we had a look at the fact that um, there is an inward man and there is an outward man <coughs> excuse me and our outward man is obviously our physical bodies and we saw that the inward man is made up of uh, three part, uh, four parts and the inward man is made up of the will of man, the conscience of man, the spirit of man, and the soul, which is, we said is the mind. <clears throat> and so we're dealing in this series of teachings um, with the part of man that um, is classified as the will of man. And we saw that um, God has given to each one of his creations a free will. Each one of us have been given um, a free will. And... Uh, that is a very unique part of uh, God's creation in the fact that he does give his creations a free will. For if we didn't have a free will, then it would be pretty similar to um, computer programming. And uh, we would then just be robots that uh, God programs to uh, operate in a certain manner. <coughs> uh, but the fact is that God has given to each one of us a free will. And so as individuals who have a free will we are in fact unique creations of God it is only God who can do that and so we said we wanted to have a look and understand how the will of man operates in the makeup of man because we had a look at various aspects of scripture and we saw that unless we understand how man is actually designed by God uh, we'll never really be able to comprehend a lot of truths in the scriptures and we'll never really be able to apply those truths to our lives and then we had a look at uh, the fact that we understand uh, under the new covenant that it is our spirits that are born again. Um, under the old covenant they didn't understand that concept because they didn't really understand the fact that man was spirit and that he lived inside of a body. <clears throat> we know that because scripture has been revealed to us, our Lord taught us we must be born again. Um, we saw the, the account with Nicodemus, he couldn't grasp that fact, he was still trying to get his mind around it by thinking in the natural and our Lord was uh, trying to uh, speak in the spiritual and so we in studying the will of man we uh, said we really need to have a look at the will of God firstly because um, this fact that God has created these, his creation with a free will um, almost kind of indicates to us that, well then chaos would reign because everybody does whatever they want to do and God is no longer in control because God is not God anymore because everybody has their own free will. But in fact, that's not the case. We understand that God is fully in control of his creation. Uh, the Bible teaches us that he works all things together uh, in accordance with the good pleasure of his will. And so the will of God always prevails. And so we're needing to understand and reconcile the concept of the will of God and the will of man um, which can at times be completely opposite to each other, how is it possible that God then is still able to have his will done in a situation where mankind by and large ignores the will of God? And so we need to have a more clear understanding of the will of God in order for us to have a clearer understanding of the will of man. And so we saw in previous teachings that we saw in scripture, the Bible teaches us that God has his perfect will and he has his permissible will. Um, the, the two aspects to God's will, which is his perfect will and his permissible will. And anything that is done outside of God's perfect will, we said is obviously done then in God's permissible will. God permits that to happen. Uh, but it is not his express will for the situation. But nevertheless, because he has given unto man their own free will, he allows mankind to do what uh, they deem fit in their lives. And so we did have a, we had a look at salvation as an example, and we saw that in fact salvation is God's perfect will for mankind, for it is the perfect will of the Father that no man perish, um, and God so loved the whole world that He gave His only begotten Son. So God made provision for every single individual on the planet to be saved, and that is the will of the Father. His desire is that everyone comes to repentance. In Christ Jesus and everyone ex everyone experiences salvation however that doesn't happen uh, because the vast majority of mankind choose to ignore God's perfect will for their lives with regards to salvation and they choose to um, follow a life that would lead them to, to, to damnation 
And so we saw that uh, damnation is in fact God's permissible will. It's not his perfect will. Perfect will is he, that everybody is saved. But he does allow most of mankind to reject his perfect will for their lives and choose um, damnation. Now, obviously, we said that no man in their right mind chooses damnation over salvation. The reason that they choose dam damnation is because they don't believe there is such a thing as a hell. They don't believe there is such a thing as heaven. And so, and they don't believe in the Son of God, being Jesus Christ. Um, and so they ignore that. And because they ignore that, God warns them. And he says, look, guys, there's a consequence that you will incur by not accepting what I've um, put out for you. Um, mankind, by and large, chooses to disbelieve God, and God gives them over to their choice, and so they follow, they walk in God's permissible will, and uh, damnation, eternal damnation, is God's permissible will. He will permit people to go to hell. He doesn't want them to go there. He is the one, in fact, we said, that actually does cast them into hell. And so we saw Another truth earlier was the fact that um, in this life that we dwell in now, God never overrides the free will of man. The, um, the man's will reigns supreme in this life. And also in the makeup of man, because we, we saw that man is, has an inner man, he has an outward man, um, and the inner man of the heart is made up of the will, the conscience, the spirit, and the soul, which is the mind. And it is the will of man that reigns supreme in the makeup of man, for it is our will, by our will, that we decide what we're going to do. Um, even when we're born again, and our spirits wants to want to serve God, um, and our flesh wants to serve the world, it is as an act of our will that we decide which way we're going to go, which uh, path we will follow. And so the will of man always reigns supreme in the makeup of man in this life. When we leave this life, we saw that the will of man in the, un, um, in the unbeliever no longer reigns supreme. In the will of man in the believer still reigns supreme because God um, has tested that individual and that individual will now spend eternity with him in heaven. Well, uh, in the New Jerusalem. However, the unbeliever, when they leave the, this life, uh, their will no longer applies because now what happens is God... Um, is the one who cast them into hell against their will. It is not, they do not jump into hell as an act of their free will. They rebel against it, they don't want to go there, but they have no choice in the matter anymore, and their will is now completely null and void. Even though they choose not to go there, they are forced to go there, and God casts them into hell. And so the will of the unbeliever reigns supreme in this life, but once this life is ended, the will of the unbeliever no longer features. Uh, things get done to them against their will, based on their choice they've made in this life. And we also saw in the previous teaching, the fact is that God knows everything. He is all-knowing. He knows, the Bible teaches us that He declares the end from the beginning. Um, in Isaiah 46, Verse 9, uh, the Lord speaking, he says, For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, I, and I will do all my pleasure. And we, so we made the statement that God never starts anything until he ends it, until he finishes it. So you say, well, what does that mean? Does that mean that God... Um, has really built, um, created the new heaven and the new earth that's already already happened. Um, in reality, in, in being man, made manifest, no, it hasn't yet happened. Um, but in the mind of God, yes, it has, because God knows everything. He sees all of the future. And so God will never start anything until he finishes it, until he knows the end. And so he then declares the end from the beginning. So when things start, God says, this is what it will turn out like. The reason that he can say that is because he knows all of the future. And because he's God, and he can obviously, um, because he says, my counsel shall stand it, and I will do all my pleasure. And so God's will does prevail um, in the affairs of man. Um, God will prevails, will, his will prevails in his creation. 
for otherwise he would not be God. Because whatever you can supersede uh, the will of God, that is God in that situation. God cannot influence the situation. Um, well, then God is not God over that situation anymore. That situation has now become greater than God. And so that's uh, an impossibility. And so God does reign supreme in, over his creation. Um, and so one of the things that he, because we're still trying to get our, our understanding around the, the, the will of God, because it's, uh, it's a very important concept for us to understand when dealing with the will of man, so that we can have a clearer understanding of how the will of man works. And so God is all-knowing. He knows all of the future. There's nothing that God does not know. Um, now, does God um, orchestrate every single thing? No, he doesn't, because if you decide to get up uh, tomorrow morning and put on brown shoes instead of black shoes, God is not the one who decides that for you. You make that decision yourself. It's an unimportant issue as far as God is concerned, so he doesn't really get involved. He knows before you put on the brown shoes that you were going to put on brown shoes because he knows all of the future, but he does not influence your choice as to what uh, pair of shoes you're going to wear tomorrow because that's an unimportant issue in the bigger scheme of things. God gets involved in the, the important issues that are going to um, change the course of our lives, for argument's sake. So God gets involved in the issue of our salvation, as to how we're going to get saved, when we're going to get saved. Um, and you know, he, he orchestrates everything around that event. Now, obviously, there's many other events that the Lord orchestrates around our lives. But he gets involved with that particular um, decision. Um, but we're in what, what kind of shoes you're going to wear tomorrow. He doesn't get involved with that decision. He leaves that over to us. We can make our own free choice in that. So it kind of gives you a bit of an indication of, as to, we said God has his perfect will. He has his permissible will. But there's also within God's, even within God's perfect will, there is such a thing as what is deemed important to God and what's not important. So again, I just relate that what is important to God in, in his perfect will is that we are saved. And so those who accept salvation, that they are now walking in God's perfect will. But one who's born again and chooses to wear black shoes on the day instead of brown, that's not a non-issue with God. And so the individual gets to make their own free choice along those lines. Um, but that's just by, as, an, as an aside, we don't want to get into that in any kind of detail today. So what we want to look at today, a couple of things, um, but we'll start off with the fact is that God has always planned our salvation. Salvation has always been on God's agenda. Remember right, Isaiah 46 again, God declares the end from the beginning. Um, in the beginning was the Word, the word, word was with God, the Word was God. Um, and so there was a beginning, we have no idea when that beginning was, but God declares that there was a beginning. And when God says in Isaiah 46 that he declares the end from the beginning, that's the end of everything God declares from the beginning. And so from the beginning, salvation was part of God's plan. It was never... Um, let's have a look at the scripture and that will give us just a, bit, a little bit of insight and we're going to comment on it. Romans chapter 5 verse 14. Scripture says, Nevertheless, day, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. And this is the point I really wanted to concentrate on. Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. So that's talking about our Lord Jesus. So the Scripture is telling us in this passage of Scripture, the Holy Spirit is revealing to us that Adam was a type of Jesus. We know the Old Testament, the Bible teaches us very plainly, is types and shadows of the new and obviously of the ages still to come. And so we can see the types and shadows in the Old Testament revealed to us in the new. But here we go, we're looking at Adam, who is the first of the creation of, of mankind. Um, and yet the scripture tells us when Adam was created, that he was a type of him who was to come speaking of our Lord Jesus. And so Adam was never God's ultimate uh, aim for the creation of mankind. It was never God's de um, um, ultimate um, plan for 
mankind to live as Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden. And so you, know, we, you hear the teaching that well, people say, all right, mankind fell in the Garden of Eden, Adam, when Adam and Eve committed sin, mankind fell, and God had to then come up with a plan of salvation to restore man to where he was and restore him to where Adam used to be. But that's not the case at all. The Bible doesn't teach us that at all. God never, God doesn't get taken by surprise with anything. And so remember what we said, God knows everything. He knows all of the future. And so Adam's sinning and Eve's sinning didn't take God by surprise and now he had to come up with plan B because plan A didn't work anymore. Uh, not at all. Plan A is always God's plan. And plan A was always Jesus. Jesus was God's plan. Adam was a step in getting to the plan of Jesus. And so it was never God's intention that mankind should live through all eternity as Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden. It was always God's intention that mankind live with him and the Lord Jesus in the heavenly Jerusalem for all eternity. That was God's um, ultimate. That, that, that's what God was always intending to do. He, he, he did it through this avenue of, of creating Adam uh, as a type of Jesus and then self, the plan of salvation. So the plan of salvation was in God's plan before Adam was created. For Adam was created as a type of him who was to come, speaking of our Lord Jesus. Let's have a look at another scripture that uh, just uh, highlights the truth for us and just, you know, there's some, these are some concepts that you really got to think about and, uh, and get your mind around um, to kind of fully grasp because, you know, they are pretty mind-blowing. But I mean, we're dealing with God and the way that God operates, so they're going to be mind-blowing. <laughs> the natural man is not going to uh, accept a lot of the stuff that we read today. And so the scripture says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, he says, He indeed, speaking of Jesus our Lord, He indeed was foreordained, where? Before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through Him believe in God, who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. And so here again, another very powerful uh, truth revealed to us in the Scripture is that um, Jesus our Lord was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Now think about that, before the foundation of the world. Now, we know that, that the world was formed before Lucifer was. Uh, Lucifer being uh, who Satan is today. Um, because we know that um, Lucifer uh, was in Eden, the Garden of God, and Eden, the Garden of God, was always on the earth, and that's where Lucifer was. That's where that's where his throne was. That's he, uh, the scripture in, in uh, again in Isaiah, in Ezekiel. Uh, Lucifer says, "I will ascend uh, my throne above the, th uh, the throne of God," and so Lucifer had a, a, a kingdom on the earth and. His throne was in the Garden of Eden, but it was there after God created it. And so God created the, the, and formed the world, with, and He put the foundation of the world together before Lucifer and any angel had been created. So before all of God's creation was even created, including, I guess, go back to Lucifer being Satan today, before Lucifer was created, look what happened. Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world. So Jesus was foreordained. And all that Jesus did was foreordained before the foundation of the world. So this whole plan of, of salvation, everything that, was, that Jesus has accomplished for us on the cross, um, was in God's plan right from before the foundation of the world. So before God started creating, God had already decided this is what's going to happen. And this is what the, the steps that will be taken through all of my creation, through the process of time, to bring to fruition that which uh, I have declared will happen. Because as we read in Scripture, God uh, always, um, His will prevails. Uh, 
And so, it's another comment that's made here, but was was but was manifest in these last times for you. So, just because we don't see it, and we see, we see it in a timeline, we see events unfolding in a timeline. We know that um, the world was created. Then we know, and I'm just in, in, with regards to these points we just highlighted. Then Lucifer was created. We know then Lucifer fell, and we know that he was judged. He became Satan, and he lost his kingdom. Uh, we know then Adam was created, and then Lucifer or Satan tempted Adam, Adam sinned, and Adam fell. Um, and then we know that Jesus was then manifested uh, a, a few thousand years later. All of that we see in timeline, but God saw it all before it all began. And so God was had put everything in place, and so in God, in his mind, in his understanding, it was... All of this had already happened, but God then brings it to pass as the timeline unfolds. God says, okay, now is your time to do this. Now this can happen. Uh, in the book of Revelation, there's a, a, a passage of scripture that talks about, um, the, I think there's two angels, or, or might be four angels that are um, at the river Euph Euphrates, and they are... The Bible says they have been prepared by God for that year, um, month, day, and hour. Uh, they will then do what God has called them to do. And so they've been there from, well, at least since the world began. Um, and they've been waiting there patiently until God says, okay, now's your time. Now you can do what I've called you to do. And so that's how God kind of operates. But anyway, the point is very clear to us in this passage of Scripture that our Lord Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Salvation was always in God's, uh, on God's agenda and it was not something that God had to put in place as plan B because plan A didn't work out with Adam and Eve. Not at all. Uh, Jesus was always plan A. Another Scripture that we can have a look at which again points everything back to uh, the beginning Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, the scripture says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, speaking about the Antichrist, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And so there our Lord Jesus, uh, that's referring to the Lamb, obviously is referring to our Lord Jesus. The scripture says he was slain from the foundation of the world. Now obviously we understand Jesus was not physically slain from the foundation of the world. He, after whatever period of time, because we have no idea what period of time he left from the foundation of the world until our Lord did go to the cross. We know what, what period of time he left in mankind's uh, calendar from the time of Adam until the time Jesus went to the cross. We know that we're looking at about four or five thousand years roughly. Um, but prior to that, we don't know how long the, the millennium, the ages were before that. Lucifer's age and all of those ages. Uh, for there were many ages before um, mankind came on the planet. But nevertheless, our Lord was only uh, crucified at the time that God said, okay, now's the time for Jesus to be made manifest in the world. But right from the beginning of time, beginning before the foundation of the world, in the scripture it says, um, from, the, from the foundation of the world, the lamb was slain. So Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. It was always God's intention that Jesus would go to the cross from the foundation of the world because God never starts anything until he finishes it. And so God has already seen the end result of what, but all of this has to take place in order for the end result to be made manifest. And so salvation, the man, mankind dwelling with God the Father and God the Son in the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, that was always God's intention. And this is the path that God has taken to get mankind to where he'll get us to one day. Um, but there's a timeline in intervening, and God decides when each event occurs in that timeline. But God has already, it's all been done. In, God, in, the, in the mind of God, it's all done. And God knows everything. God knows exactly uh, who accepts salvation, who won't accept salvation. Um, and so that is how God operates, because he knows everything. 
and he plans everything before he ever um, starts it. So he, he ends it before he starts it. That's the way God operates. Okay, so we want to understand just a little bit about the, God, the predestination because we kind of had a glimpse of the fact that you know God has, had already predestined before the foundation of the world that Jesus would go to the cross. So that was always part of God's plan. And so God has predestined everything to take place. Nothing, nothing took God and ever does take God by surprise. Um, for he's all knowing. So God does predestine uh, because that he, he is God. And so his will prevails. So we need to understand how does how do we reconcile um, God predestined in our lives and giving us a free will at the same time. How is that possible? The two points seem to be irreconcilable. That mankind has a free will and yet the will of God prevails. So how do we reconcile the two? Well, let's have a look at some scripture that will help us to, to unpack uh, this, this concept. And the first scripture we'll look at is in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. Scripture says, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, speaking of Jesus our Lord, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And so there it is, predestination again. God predestines because he can, because he is God. His will prevails. Again, it goes on to say, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will and so the will of God will always prevail and so God's will prevails because he predestines and we'll understand um, how it is that God is able to predestine as we go through the, uh, some more scriptures along this line but the, the, the fact is that God does predestine he's predestined the whole of mankind um, we saw the scripture that uh, Jesus was always predestined to go to the cross um, because God knew that that was the step he what needed to take in order to redeem mankind to himself. Now, God knows those who are going to dwell with him in all eternity. God knows those who are going to reject him and go to all eternity of hell um, because God knows all the future. But God predestines then our lives accordingly based on his foreknowledge of us. So let's have a look at, um, we just want to get, get our mind more around the fact that God does predestine our lives. Because we've seen how God does predestine, had, did predestine salvation right before he even created the, uh, the world. Or the world, um, salvation was God's perfect plan. And that had already been put in place in the mind of God before it actually happened. Here's another scripture that just helps us to see the fact that God's will prevails um, because he is God. And the scriptures in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, beginning in verse 16. Our Lord speaking, he says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And so, um, very clearly our Lord said to the disciples, Guys, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Um, so, you know, then how we've got to get this reconciliation. But I thought, I've got a free will. Well, yes you do but God's will always prevails and so Jesus just made it very plain to us and this is what we have to get our minds around we have to get to understand this Jesus said very clearly and what he said to his disciples on the earth he says to his disciples today as well it hasn't changed um, for Jesus is the same yesterday today and forever and so we actually don't choose Jesus Jesus has chosen us uh, he has chosen those who um, will be saved and those who will not be saved. Uh, as you said, that's a harsh statement. We're going to go through, as I said, there's some, some difficult concepts we need to get around uh, in this series of teachings. Um, 
you remember that on more than one occasion our Lord would say, many are called, but few are chosen. And uh, the one scripture is in Matthew 22, 14, when he said that. And so our Lord very plainly tells us as his disciples, uh, you did not choose me, I chose you. And that stays, and God's will prevails. And so God predestines, God chooses, um, for he is God and not we ourselves. Uh, let's have a look at another scripture that, again, highlights the truth for us. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, the scripture says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Verse 4, Just as He chose us in Him, when? Before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having be predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. And so there we, you know, in that, uh, just those three verses of Scripture, we have this whole concept just put out for us very clearly. God chose us. When did He choose us? Scripture says, before the foundation of the world. So remember what we said, uh, God always finishes something before he starts it. So God sees all the way down through the whole of the future and he sees um, Mike. And so he chooses Mike to come into the kingdom of God. And we'll understand as we go through the teaching why he chooses Mike. But nevertheless, he does. He chooses Mike. Mike is now one I have chosen for salvation. Uh, Peter is another one I've chosen for salvation. John I've chosen for salvation. And so when did he do it? He did it before the foundation of the world, before Mike was ever created, before Peter and John were ever created, he, God had already chosen them for salvation. Now to choose something means that one is chosen, another one. Remember our Lord said, many are called, few are chosen. And so it isn't a case of God chose everybody. That's not how God, that's not what the scripture is saying. The scripture is saying those whom are saved have already been chosen. As I remember our Lord saying, speaking to us as disciples, you guys didn't choose me, I chose you. And so it is the will of God. Remember the perfect will of God said all men be saved, but not all men accept salvation. And so they enter into God's permissible will. But nevertheless, even those who enter into God's perfect will of salvation, God chose them for salvation. And so that's a, a, a truth we need to you know, get our minds around and understand. Um, and then he goes on to say, having predestined us to adoption, and so our lives were predestined for salvation. Adoption and salvation pretty much one and the same thing. And so we, you know, God was always at work in our lives to bring us to that place where we, we would be um, able to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. He worked things around in our lives. Now remember we, right at the outset I kind of said God didn't get involved with what color shoes I wore every single day for argument's sake. But God certainly got involved with um, arranging the people that would influence my life at the point where I would be able to give uh, my life to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. He would bring people across my path, influence uh, that I would interact with those people. He would uh, put me on those people's minds that they would pray and intercede for me. I, I, you know, this is the kind of thing that God does. And he would predestine all of that to happen so that Mike would get to the point where Mike would be confronted with the gospel and would accept Jesus Christ as Lord. But in order for Mike to get there, God had chosen Mike before the foundation of the world that Mike was going to be saved. And so because he was going to be saved, God then predestined my life to get to that point of salvation. And that's, for, that's the same for every single believer, every single child of God that gets born again. And that's just one aspect of our lives. This being salvation, it's the, it's, the, it's the main aspect, obviously, being born again. But that's how God does it. So before the foundation of the world, God chooses the individuals. Because He has chosen those individuals, He then predestines their lives to get to the point where they are able to then come into the kingdom. And so God, in fact, has chosen, as Jesus said, you guys didn't choose me. I chose you. Um, and again, the scripture says, according to the good pleasure of his will. 
The will of God prevails because He is God. And so that's how um, God is able to predestine our lives. And He does it when he, He's done everything. Before you know, before He starts, He finishes. You've got to get your mind around that fact. That God, in the mind of God, everything's done. And nothing takes God by surprise. Uh, that's because He's God. Let's have a look at another scripture. Now this is going to help us to understand predestination because a lot of Christians have a huge problem with predestination you know because it just in their minds it screams God must be unjust because now why would he choose this one over that one uh, why would he you know he'd say well this one gets to be saved but that one does not get to be saved um, that doesn't sound like a just God and we know God is just so you know how do we now reconcile that um, and predestination. That's why a lot of uh, Christians get a problem, have a problem with predestination. They, they, they have a problem because they think, well, okay, well, now God's created robots because no man really doesn't have a free choice anyway because God's will is always going to prevail. Um, but that's not the case, and we'll have a look at how free will of man still prevails in this life, uh, bear in mind. Uh, um, but also, so they have that problem. Then they also have the problem with predestination. They say, okay, but then, then God must be unjust because now he's predestined uh, this person to go to heaven and predestined that person to go to hell. So how do we reconcile that one? Because let's, let's see if we can get the scripture to reconcile that particular point for us. The scripture we'll look at is in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Um, we've had a look at uh, the scripture in Ephesians where predestination is, is mentioned in verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure, pleasure of his will. And so there's predestination there straight away, and God's will being done. Um, but it, it, we don't get the full truth out of that passage of Scripture. This passage helps us to understand a little bit more um, with regards to predestination. And let's have a look at it. Romans chapter 8, verse 29, the Scripture says, for whom he foreknew, very important, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And so here the Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul, um, highlights the truth for us, which is very important, with regards to predestination. He links it with foreknowledge. Foreknowledge. Well, what does he say? For whom he foreknew, talking about God, for whom God foreknew, God also predestined. And so we kind of can, we get, we get an idea now that predestination, God always predestines based on his foreknowledge. Remember we said right at the outset of this teaching, God knows everything. We don't say God knows everything. Not only does he know everything is going to happen, but he knows everything. He knows uh, uh, the inner he knows our inner man. He knows every part of us. Okay. Remember when uh, uh, Samuel, the Lord says, I want you to go and anoint the next king of Israel. And he sends him to Jesse's home. And uh, you know the story. And, and, and Jesse's got eight sons. He brings seven of them before Samuel. And Sam, God says, no, these, these aren't the guys. So eventually you know, Samuel says, have you got another son? And he says, yeah, I've got another young one right out there looking after the sheep. So he says, bring him. So they bring him. God says, that's the one. But before that, God said to him, because now Samuel's looking at these guys, and so they are quite big strapping guys, and Samuel said, surely this must be it. And God says, ah, uh -uh. God doesn't look on the outside. God looks upon the heart. And so God knows our hearts. That's very important to God. God looks upon the heart, and God searches our hearts. And so, because that's the quality that God's looking for. Who can I take into eternity with me? He, because God's not wanting to go through another Lucifer and another... Uh, you know, you know, Adam and Eve, they, had te they were tempted. And uh, so, you know, there, there was kind of an outside temptation. Lucifer, that wasn't the case. Lucifer, no one tempted him. He uh, uh, fell of his own accord. But anyway, be that as a man. God doesn't want that to go in, into eternity with him. So what God does is he looks upon the hearts of men. And so he knows 
what we are like, what we um, are capable of. Um, you know, so based on what his knowledge of us, he then says, okay, well that one I can choose for eternity, to spend eternity with me. That one I can't. I've looked on the heart of both individuals, and the heart of that individual, it, there's potential here that I can work with. The heart of this individual, there's, there's just rebellion there. That individual will not bow their knee to me willingly. Um, that one will, that one won't. And so God, based on his foreknowledge of us, predestines our lives accordingly. Let's look at it again. It says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined. And so predestination is always based on God's foreknowledge of who we are and what we have the potential to become. And so, you know, God knows by, by looking at uh, the Apostle Peter that here's one I can use to do this because his heart is right before me. And so I can now predestine his life in that direction because I can get that out of him. Whereas um, Judas, his heart is not right before me. And so I will have to predestine his life uh, in the other direction. And so a predestination is always based on God's foreknowledge of us. God always knows what we will do um, as an act of our own free will. And so let's look at the at, at, at salvation again, uh, because I mean that is really the, the, the crux of our Christian walk is whether we're saved or not. And so on salvation, God knows before he created Mike, if I present my son uh, and the, the, the salvation message to Mike, will he bow his knee of his own free will? Will Mike say, Lord, I accept you as my Lord and Savior? And God knows, yes, Mike will do that because God knows the future. God knows everything about me before I'm even created. So God looks upon my heart and he says, that one will bow his knee willingly to my son. So therefore, I can predestine him for salvation. The one next to him, presented with that same, same choice. Remember, this is the free choice that we've exercised. I exercise my free choice to accept Jesus as my Lord. But God knew I would do that, and so he predestined my life around that. Whereas another individual, um, God knows they will not accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They might do so you know, by pretending, but he, God looks upon the heart. And so he knows that they actually will never bow their knee to the Lord. There will always be, there will be that element of rebellion there. And so God predestines their lives accordingly. And some never get to hear the gospel of salvation um, because God knows they will never accept the gospel of salvation. Now again, again people say, oh, you know, uh, how can you say Jesus is the only way? What, what about the individual who's living in the Amazon jungle and has never heard the gospel? Um, well, again, God has certainly shown him, we're not going to get into that teaching, but you know, the scripture does tell us that God has shown him that he exists by him just looking around. And so he does know, he knows God, and he knows God is God. But he doesn't get to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ as his saviour. Now, people say, well, then that can't be right, because, you know, why did God let him um, go to hell? And he never even had the opportunity to, to accept Jesus as Lord. Well, don't forget God knows all of the future and he knows every single person and he knows everything. And so he knows that individual would never accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so God predestines his life accordingly because God does not uh, waste resources um, by, by, you know, call, Jesus teaches us, don't cast your pearls before swine. And so God doesn't do that. He doesn't do it. He teaches us not to do it. He certainly doesn't do it. And because God knows that so and so will never bow their knee to Jesus, it would be a waste of my time to give them the opportunity to bow their knee because they're not going to do it. So God doesn't give them the opportunity because He knows they won't accept it. And so that's how God is able to predestine our lives for salvation and predestine others uh, for destruction. Because really at the end of the day, those who are not saved are going to be destroyed. 
in hell or in, in, in the lake of fire and brimstone forever. Um, but it's always based on God's foreknowledge. So God, God's not unjust. God knows and God um, predestines and he acts based on his knowledge, what he knows. Let's have a look at another scripture which just reinforces this predestination being linked to God's foreknowledge because that is the, the crux of it. Um, if you understand that God knows everything, then you can understand why God can predestine one in one direction and the life of another in another direction because God knows everything. Let's have a look at another scripture, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Verse 2, elect, now elect means chosen, same thing, elect or chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. And so here the Apostle Peter is saying exactly what the Apostle Paul had said to us. Paul said, um, for those whom he foreknew, he was a predestined. Peter says, elect or chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. And so Peter's saying the same thing. He said, you guys were chosen according to the foreknowledge. The reason you were chosen because God knew he could choose you. Because you would respond and you would um, bow your knee willingly to the Lord. Uh, so that is why he chose you because he knew you he, you would accept him and so um, predestination is always based on God's foreknowledge it's never a case of God take, takes a chance God doesn't take chances so he, he, God doesn't roll the dice and hope it comes out to, you know hope let's hope this one works out it didn't work out all right well, let's go back to the drawing board not at all God knows, and so based on God's knowledge, foreknowledge, foreknowledge, not just his knowledge, his foreknowledge. He knows before it happens, he knows what's going to happen. And so based on what he knows, and he knows the person, the, his creation, he knows what his creation will do. And because he knows that, he then predestines their lives accordingly. And so let's have a look at a scripture which just very clearly puts it out there to us that God predestines our lives. Um, and when you look at this passage of scripture in isolation, it does look like, well, you know, God must be unjust because, you know, how can he do this? But don't forget, you have to go back to what we've already said. God does predestine, but he does it based on his foreknowledge of the person that he's dealing with. And because he knows what that person's all about, he predestines their lives accordingly. So let's have a look at the scripture. Romans chapter 9, verse 14 beginning in verse 14 um, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul saying what shall we say then is there unrighteousness with God certainly not okay because uh, yeah we can uh, Paul's addressing the argument because people are saying yeah God must be unrighteous if this is the way he operates and uh, Paul saying, uh -uh, look at it verse 15 he says certainly not verse 15 for he says to Moses God speaking to Moses I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion so then it is not of him who wills nor of him who runs but of God who shows mercy but now look at the example he puts forward he says for the scripture says to the Pharaoh for this very purpose I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth therefore he has mercy on whom he wills and whom he wills he hardens you will say to me then why does he still find fault for who has resisted his will verse 20 but indeed O man who are you to reply against God will the thing formed say to him who formed it why have you made me like this does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of vessels, the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand 
for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. And so here we, uh, the Apostle Paul puts forward the example of Pharaoh to us, uh, of predestination. Um, because God says, you know, I'm going to harden who I want to harden. I will have mercy on who I want to have mercy on. And uh, he, he puts the example of Pharaoh forward because uh, the, uh, God speaks to Pharaoh. And he says, for this very purpose, I raised you up that I may show my power in you, that my name may be declared in all the earth. And so we all know what happened with Pharaoh. Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And uh, Pharaoh says, no way, it's not going to let that happen. And so God judges Egypt and the judgment of the judgment of the judgment comes through. And eventually, the last one is that uh, even Pharaoh's elder son is killed, and so Pharaoh lets them go. Um, but in all that time, every time that Moses comes to Pharaoh to say, you need to let my people go, the Bible teaches us very plainly that God hardens the heart of Pharaoh. So Pharaoh says, no, I'm not going to let that happen. And so God, God's involved here. God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Now, why does God do that? Well, because the scripture says um, God raised Pharaoh up that he would that God could show his power in Pharaoh uh, and that his name would be declared in all the earth. So God predestined Pharaoh to be rebellious against the will of God. You say, okay, well, now that just goes to prove that you know, we just don't have any choice in the matter. No. Now you read that passage of scripture in light of the ones we've just discussed, based on God's foreknowledge. God foreknew what Pharaoh was like. He knew his heart. Before he created him, God knew, okay, this creation of mine is a bad apple and he's not going to bow his knee ever. And so I will now predestine him uh, for destruction. I will now uh, um, mold his life because that's, that's ultimately what Pharaoh wants. Pharaoh wants to be in rebellion against God. God knows that. So God says, okay, that's what you really want, Pharaoh. Now we're going to mold your life so that you will actually be very rebellious to, to me. But I will use that for my glory because I will display to the whole earth what I can actually do. And so it was based on God's foreknowledge of Pharaoh that he predestined Pharaoh's life in that manner. And so just as God predestines our lives for good, so he predestines those for destruction. The vessels prepared for destruction, the scripture says. Um, and God, because now he's God, because now out of the same lump, he makes one vessel for, for honor and another for dishonor. But he does that because he knows that the vessel for dishonor would never bow their knee to him. And so he says, okay, well, that's really what you want. Well, now I'm going to make your life accordingly. This one will bow his knee to me quite willingly, and so I will now predestine his life according to that. And so that's, that's how we reconcile predestination um, with the free will of mankind also being involved. Because now don't forget, if you go back and you study the, the, what happened during the Pharaoh uh, and Moses' account, every time God gave Pharaoh every opportunity to repent, and to let the children of Israel go, because Moses came, he said, you're going to get judgment, let my people go. So if you, God kind of puts it out there, he says, you know, you really don't need to go this way, if you don't want to, Pharaoh, you know, we can just call it quits here. But um, Pharaoh didn't want to go down that road, and so as, a, as an act of his free will, he rebelled against God. But we, we, we do understand that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, but God hardened Pharaoh's heart based on God's foreknowledge of Pharaoh and God knowing what it is that uh, Pharaoh in fact would um, opt out to do. Here's another uh, scripture that is quite controversial but it's in the Bible and it just highlights again this truth for us. Proverbs 16 verse 4, scripture says, The Lord has made all for himself, yes, even the wicked for the day of doom. And so the wicked, God has prepared for vessels of destruction. And so uh, they will be destroyed because they have chosen to live a wicked life. And so God says, okay, well, that's, that's the life I will predestine for you. Uh, another scripture that just highlights for us again that God does all this stuff before the creation ever comes about, before uh, we are even born. 
um, Romans chapter 9, verse 10. Scripture says, and not only, th only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, verse 11, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. And so God knows, you know, before um, Esau and, um, and, and Jacob were born, God already knew, obviously, what they would turn out to be like. And so that's why he said before they were born, that the older will serve the younger, and Jacob I've loved, but Esau I've hated, right from the start, because he knew that Esau wouldn't bow his knee to him, Jacob would. And so that's why God could say what he did, and God, that's why God predestined their lives accordingly. Um, the one who followed after God's perfect will, ultimately, is our Lord Jesus. He came to the earth and he was the perfect man and he submitted his will completely to the will of the Father. And Jesus did that because he was completely submissive. The scripture in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 7 says, Then I said, speaking of Jesus, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. And so Jesus read God's account of what God had planned for Jesus' life. And he came down and he then was completely submissive to the will of the Father. And he did exactly what the Father had predestined his life to, to, um, to become. And so we're going to close off um, with one more example, and that is Judas Iscariot. Because... Yeah, you, you get a lot of Christians that say, yeah, they, well, firstly, some people say, well, yeah, did, did God forgive Judas? Because he was remorseful, the scripture says. Um, so, you know, is, did Judas, well, because he was remorseful, did God forgive him? And is he in heaven today? And the answer to that one is, no, it's not. He's not in heaven. He's in hell. Um, he was remorseful, but he didn't ever uh, receive forgiveness. In fact, he didn't ask for it. Uh, and so we can pick up a couple of scriptures that just highlight again the truth for us. Matthew 26, verse 24. Our Lord is speaking. He says, The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. Again, there's Jesus following the perfect will of the Father. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed, referring to Judas. Look at what our Lord says. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And he said to him, You have said it. And so our Lord kind of just put the, the answer to that question through for us, in that he said, It would be, have been good for that man if he had never been born. And so the only way that Judas could have avoided destruction uh, was to not be born. At the moment that he was born into the earth, he was predestined for destruction because. God had already seen his heart before he came into the earth. And so God predestined his life around that. We know that, and so, you know, anyway, it's far better to be with our Lord Jesus in heaven for all eternity than to never, have never been born. And so um, our Lord said that it would have been better for Judas to have never been born. Translated means because he was born, he ended up in hell for all eternity. And... Acts chapter 1 verse 24, um, again just re-emphasizing the fact for us about where Judas is today. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell. Why? That he might go to his own place, which is indicating he went down to hell. And so Judas definitely um, was predestined to betray the, the, the Son of God. Now, God could do that because God knew, foreknew Judas and knew what was inside Judas's heart. And so he knew that Judas would never bow his knee willingly to the Lord, but it would always rebel. And so God said, okay, well, I'll choose you now to be the one that will betray my son, and so you will be destroyed because of, of your, your choice. And Judas made his own choice. Nobody forced him to do what he did. But God knew that he would do that, and so God predestined his life around that. 
If you go look and read Psalm 109, verse 6 to 19, you can see exactly uh, the outcome of Judas's uh, betrayal of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit re reveals that to us. And so clearly God predestined Judas's life for destruction. And that's what God does. God, based on his foreknowledge of each one of us, predestines our lives accordingly. And that is where predestination comes in. It's always based on God's foreknowledge of the individual. And uh, that's as far as we're going to cover today with regards to um, the will of God. In the next series of teaching, we want to have a look at uh, the fact that although God knows everything, He doesn't reveal everything. And that will give us a, a, a further uh, understanding of this truth about the fact that um, of how the will of God actually does work in this earth in relation to the will of man. But we'll end the teaching on that point today.